The Marvel Snap devs have answered the call, nerfing arguably the best card in the best deck in the game, as well as buffing some of the worst, and a change to one of the most hated in this action-packed patch that also includes some very solid quality of life updates. Let's jump into it. Now, I know you might be asking, KM, you said the best card in the best deck, and I think there is actually a very coherent argument for Time Stone being the best card in the best deck, Without Time Stone, I think a lot of the obvious snaps in the Thanos deck would be a lot less obvious. The Thanos deck is currently constructed to be a ramp deck, and this is the stone that actually ramps you, and now it won't be doing that anymore. Time Stone is now going to draw a card and then discount that card by one. Instead of being an all-purpose ramp tool, the ever-present Time Stone into Professor X on four, Time Stone into Vision on four, Time Stone on, on four into a bigger six drop. This is not happening anymore. Time Stone is now going to be mostly luck-based, and that gives it some legitimate high roll potential. I know from my experience playing against Sheenot decks that sometimes a shocker can be, you know, shockingly good. But this does lower the average use case of this stone by a very significant margin. And I think it would not be a stretch to say that this stone is at least as good as the Mind Stone when you have it in your opening hand. I know I've talked to Lambie about it recently, and he is of the belief that Time Stone into Hope Summers is your actual best opener as opposed to just having the Mind Stone. I think after a change like this, it very obviously becomes a little bit more Mind Stone centric again. This is a big deal. I'm not sure exactly how Thanos not necessarily recovers from this, but adapts to it. Making it less of an inherent ramp deck is a very interesting proposition. The question then becomes, does the other ramp tools that Thanos have access to, you know, Psylocke, Hope Summers, Wave, do those tools keep it competitive enough as a ramp deck to be a legitimate threat? My instinct is that it ends up becoming a little bit less of a ramp deck and a little bit more of a control deck, a Professor X, a Lyoth type deck that is leaning on cards like Mockingbird in order to make up for the energy it was otherwise cheating with the Time Stone. I think Time Stone, along with Mockingbird's release, ends up pushing Thanos away from being a Scar deck. A lot of the time you would ask yourself the question, why would I be playing Scar when I could be playing Mockingbird? Mockingbird gets to be cheaper a lot easier than Scar does, and that cheapness matters a lot more than two points of power. In addition, Scar, without this ramp stuff in the deck, with less of this ramp stuff in the deck at least, is going to be a notable bit worse because there's just not going to be as much, you know, turn five, six drops anymore. And those turn five, six drops are kind of what enables your Scar to be cheaper. So overall, I'm not sure exactly where Thanos adapts from here. The more it becomes a Professor X, Blue Marvel, Claw type control deck, the worse it gets into the card Loki, which puts it in a bit of an awkward situation. But by the same token, we've seen so much success with this current Hope summers -y build of Thanos that I think even a change like this might not knock him out of the metagame. It might not even change the deck all that much. It might just, you know, add Mockingbird in keep playing the same kind of thing, Professor X Eliath, we're probably going to be doing okay. So this is a change, in my opinion, that definitely needed to happen. Because if we're talking about nerfing the best card in the best deck, and the deck still ends up probably being okay, that's a big sign that it deserved that nerf. The devs took this opportunity of relative Thanos weakness and relative lack of lockjaw to give Leech an on-reveal ability again. Now, before everyone gets out their pitchforks and storms second dinner HQ, it is not the same on-reveal ability that Leech used to have. Leech will now be a tech card aimed specifically at other on-reveal abilities. This is a card that will blow up your opponent's Wong deck. This is a card that will stop your opponent's Doctor Doom. This is now no longer a card that's going to stop something along the lines of a Null, or things of that nature. Now, you have cards in your deck that are going to be good into a Leech. Leech is a much more balanced card. It's no longer just a card that turns everything off. And I think this is, frankly, a good spot for it to be in. With the recent nerfs to Lockjaw, Leech has been allowed to exist in this sort of weird limbo where it was originally changed because with Lockjaw, it was very much overpowered with the old on reveal ability. And then it was just like doing this thing where it wasn't really doing its own job. It wasn't preventing Heladex from existing or Saradex from existing. It was doing other people's jobs. 
It was just preventing big decks like Thanos from being interacted with in a reasonable way. And I think that this gives people sort of a lever to play against it if it ever becomes too dominant again. You just play a deck without a bunch of on reveals. You play something that's more reliant on ongoings. You do something of that nature and you'll actually run over Leech. I think it's good in this sense because Leech was designed as a release valve for a lot of the more broken things in the game. And it wasn't very good at that, but it still maintains that ability. Like if for some reason, like Wong gets really broken or Shuri Nimrod gets really broken, you can turn off their ability to capitalize on that kind of stuff and Leech will still fill that role. And it can even still turn off your opponent's Shang-Chi if that's something you're really interested in. You can still do that. But the issue that you'll run into is 5-3 uh, is really bad. And <laughs> that is still not exactly as good as what it was doing previously. So I think this is good because it gives people a release valve to the release valve. Instead of being a release valve in previous metas, Leech was enforcing other cards' dominance, preventing you from interacting with them. Now you have a release valve to that dynamic just by not playing cards that he can stop. I think this is a good change. Obviously, you know, I still think people are going to hate this card. People are going to hate when their stuff gets blown up and they can't really do anything about it. Yeah, they're going to hate that. I get it. But I think this gives you, it's similar to the Galactus change where it's like, now it is very clearly asking a question that you can answer. And I think that's a good thing. Elsa Bloodstone is going back to her old functionality, but getting put to three cost. And I think this is not a nerf, but I'm not sure how much of a buff it actually is. I do not expect this iteration of Elsa Bloodstone to be very good. And that said, the current iteration of Elsa Bloodstone is not very good. I think that a lot of people have been playing it in these sort of Hope Summers move mid-range decks, and I think that it's overwhelmingly pretty bad in those move mid-range decks, and you'd be much more suited by, instead of playing bad cards to synergize with this, playing good cards that are just simply better on rate. I personally do not think that current Elsa has a space in the metagame. I do expect this to be a controversial change. I expect a lot of people to be like, oh man, they nerfed her. And I don't think they did. <laughs> I think that this is a fine thing to do. Uh, but before we dive into what the potential meta implications are on too deep of a level, let's talk about just the mechanical ones. This Elsa will no longer work with Brood. It will work with Beast again. It will work with Falcon again. It'll work the way Elsa worked on release. However, it will have lost a number in the text box. Instead of giving plus three, it'll give plus two. And it will have gained that number in the cost instead of costing two it will cost three and it will keep the three that it got when it was nerfed originally elsa bloodstone is no longer the powerhouse that she was and frankly i don't think this brings her any closer to being that i think it's sort of a lateral move for her but i think it gives her more obvious homes and i think as other cards in her niche have been nerfed cards like angela it's fair to experiment with what elsa can do as a three cost version of herself I personally think that this kind of card fits better in those Hope mid-range decks. It just doesn't fit well enough that you actually want to go out of your way to make it happen. I'm interested to see what other people come up with for this card, but me personally, it feels like a lateral move. I think current Elsa was not very playable. I think three-cost old Elsa is not very playable. I think if they wanted to make this playable, and I don't think they did, they would have either cut off the cost and put it back to 2-2, two, two, or they would have simply just given it, you know, 3-3 three, three, and then giving it plus 3. Not doing either of those things makes me feel like this is a card they're still pretty scared of and they're willing to take small steps with. And I think that's generally okay. What I really don't understand is why it took this long. <laughs> like, I just, I just don't get it. I'm not really sure why, but hey, it took this long. Hopefully we'll get some kind of communication on what exactly happened because this was a nerf they were teasing for an extended period of time or a buff they were teasing, I suppose, for an extended period of time. You can really tell that I don't know if it's a nerf or a buff just based on how I'm talking about it. Uh, they were teasing this for an extended period of time and it just sort of never panned out until now. I'm glad it happened, but I think after all the teasing, I, I kind of did expect something bigger, but I'm happy that it's a card they're paying attention to. I do think that if they want to... Make it a serious consideration again, might be in line for another buff. Mantis is finally getting the text that accidentally showed up on her one day last month. Uh, this, I don't really think it does much for Mantis's viability. Uh, she is now a 2 2 that copies the card that triggers her. So you play Mantis and Mantis goes off and she gets a copy of the card that your opponent played. Uh, if there's multiple cards played, you get a copy of one of them. It is random, as far as I'm aware. 
as I understand it, I don't really think this is a better card or a worse card necessarily. I just kind of think it's sort of doing the same thing as it was. It does sort of remove the, uh, like the mill dream from this card, but this was always like kind of the worst mill card if we're going to be real about it. In as much as any mill card was good, this was probably the worst unless you count Baron Mordo as a mill card, which I don't, and even Baron Mordo saw play in a Ronin deck even if he sucked, right? Like, this is a card that basically never saw play anywhere. I think I saw, like, one Korean player played in Loki one time, and it was mid, and I think that that really just sort of speaks to just how awkward and bad this card really is. There you have moved it around multiple times. It has never found a true home, and I think, you know, for most of the Guardians, including this one, that's okay. I think that's fine. I think having cards that sort of teach new players the value of like what the vanilla curve is, what you can do, how much it takes to go out of your way to get an advantage like getting an extra card in your hand. I think that stuff's good for the new player experience. I just wouldn't really expect new player experience cards like Mantis to make a big moves in High Infinite. This might be the single most impactful buff in the entire group of buffs that we've gotten this month. Like this is a big deal. I cannot stress this enough. Meek is no longer moving randomly and is gaining what is effectively Nightcrawler text if you discard a card. That's nuts. That's seriously, seriously good. This card moving randomly sucked. This card as a Nightcrawler is awesome. When you discard a card, this card gains effectively the Nightcrawler ability every time you discard a card. It's not like it stacks or anything, but as long as you're discarding cards, you can put this guy where you want him to go, and that's it. You don't have to move him next turn. He can just stay there. You get control over this now. This is a big deal, and the reason this is a big deal is because I already think Discard is really good. It is one of two decks, in my opinion, that is competing for fair mid-range deck in how it plays, and this is a big buff to the ability to do that. Having the ability to control where your power goes really makes it tough to play against Discard, because now, okay, there's this guy on the final turn of the game moving around. There's a Dracula on the final turn of the game moving around. There's a bunch of swarms in their hand. There's an Apocalypse in their hand. Where are they putting the power? And that kind of control that you have forces your opponent into very awkward situations. Like it reminds, it's remind, the deck is reminding me more and more of the old, you know, Silky Smooth deck. And that's sort of the role it has in the metagame. It just doesn't really have the ability to play tech. So it's more like Brood Abs, but it's like Brood Abs without the predictability. It has the power of Brood Abs, but now you're adding all these ways for it to be unpredictable with Proxima Midnight coming into the deck with multiple swarms coming down if you play the MODOK, with big apocalypses being an option, you even have an option to like go for the apocalypse and then discard a swarm into the Dracula to like juke people. There's just a lot of point potential in this deck and it just got a finesse tool. I think this card is good as hell now. I will say right now, I think it's likely that the dominant versions of the discard deck are playing no meek currently, playing, you know, Helicarrier and Corvus Glaive instead. I think that might change. I think this card is seriously, seriously good. I mean, I, for one, am playing Meek, but generally, if you don't have him, I think a lot of the discard decks are fine playing Helicarrier instead of him currently. After a change like this, we'll have to reassess. My instinct would be that this card becomes extremely core, extremely fast. I'm not entirely sure, but I know one person, at least, who's going to be very excited for this, and that's Dara J.N. If you don't get that joke, he's Meek Enjoyer now. That's what he changed his name to. It's Meek Enjoyer. So he's about to enjoy some Meeks. Cable's been on a journey similar to Forge's journey, where he goes all over the cost, place, power situation. I kind of butchered that. He goes all over the place in terms of cost and power, and he ends up back where he started, but like with an additional power. Much like Forge started as a 2-1 and just like went everywhere and then ended up back as a 2-2, Cable started as a 2-2, ended up back as a 2-3. So after all of that, he gained a power. I actually am kind of interested in 2-3 Cable. Like, I'm not saying it's the greatest card of all time. It's just like, oh, you know what? 2-3 draw card is, like, kind of compelling to me. Like, it's not, I'm not overly into it, but, like, 2-3 draw card is, like, pretty good. And, like, I can see myself playing this in Loki. Like, that extra point of power really does matter. There's not a lot of good cards to play in that spot in Loki. I, I kind of think Cable might start showing up a little bit more in your games. I'm not going to lie. 2-3 draw card, legit. 
Two, three, deny your opponent a card. Not as legit, but draw cards, pretty damn good text to staple onto a two, three, especially in a deck like Loki that cares a lot more about card volume than what those specific cards are. I can very much see this being like a default two drop now. Like, I'm not sure if it's better than Mirage. It very easily could be, though, because you have to play the card from Mirage in order to get the value. So if you're just curving into a Loki and you're not ever going to play the card from Mirage, this is pretty similar. It's a pretty similar card. I'm glad it exists now because now if someone comes up and they ask, hey, you know, KM, I don't have Mirage for my Loki deck. What do I play instead? I think Cable's a really solid option. Mbaku got a buff and he still seems kind of unplayable, but he did get a legitimate buff. Mbaku will now have the Proxima Midnight text of jumping to your location with the lowest power. Yes, this is technically a buff, but I'm not sure it's really going to make you want to play a lot of Mbaku. I think maybe the only deck I could see really legitimately wanting this card is something like Cerebro 2, but I mean, they probably have better options, but at least at this point, it's like, all right, you know what? Fine, you're probably going to get people with it. Maybe he can be your cube juicer card. You know what I mean? Maybe you, the, the venerable wise Cerebro 2 gamer, can really get some people and scam them out of this with your M'Baku. I mean, it's going to be like a free six power if you can pull it off, and if you don't pull it off, you can probably fit the one in, right? Like, it's not the end of the world playing this guy in a deck like that. It probably is the end of the world playing him in basically anything else, but it's not the end of the world playing him in a deck like Cerebro 2. I don't think it's going to be the greatest thing you can do, but at least there's some conversation to be had for when a card that is or has been totally unplayable becomes mildly playable. I feel like this change is going to go down pretty poorly with the community, and frankly, I don't know who I agree with on this one. This is a change to Yondu, who is currently, I guess you'd say currently, it's not really currently, he's currently what it says right next to me, but Yondu previously was a card that would destroy at random, because, uh, you know, the top card of your opponent's deck is random. Uh, now he destroys the lowest cost card in your opponent's deck, and I think a lot of people are going to look at this and be like, that's a huge nerf. And I think I would disagree with those people. I, it's basically nothing to me. I don't view this as a real change. Uh, Yondu was not a card that was a real card. This is a card that if you had a previous reason to play it, it was either one, you were not particularly good at the game and you thought that getting rid of cards in your opponent's deck was good rather than deck thinning for them. Or two, you are on a budget playing destroy and looking to discount like sometimes high roll and null. And I think in that second situation, it actually is a legitimate nerf, but I also think nobody was really doing that, right? Yondu was a card that saw basically no play as soon as X-23 came out. And I think it, if you are trying to play Destroy with Yondu instead of like X-23 or whatever, you're just setting yourself up for failure and you can likely do something better. I also think that I side with the community on this one, though, because it's like, you know, that there was there's no real reason for this. I don't get it. Why would this be good? And so I set out to find an answer to why would this be good, and I've got one theory for you. One of the data mine cards in the near future is called Baron Zemo. He's a 4-6. Baron Zemo, when you play him, copies a card from your opponent's deck on your side of the board. If you use something like Yondu to get rid of all the bad stuff, that card only copies good stuff. That's my pitch for why this happened. I don't actually know. <laughs> like, I have no idea. It's the only thing I can even come close to thinking of, right? Like, otherwise, it just feels like we're just doing this for the sake of doing it. Or, like, I, I don't really get it. I don't, I, I just don't get it. I don't know what upside this could have because Yondu's risk already was that you were playing this card and you know you're getting rid of one of their cards but like at least it's like at least the dream of Yondu was you get rid of one of their key big expensive things right and now it just like straight up can't do that it like will only hit the non key big expensive things right like it'll only ever hit that Yondu basically ever, ever only ever did two things one was live the dream of pretending the card is disruption, and the other was live the dream of hitting something really big and then playing a null. 
right? And it can't do either of those things now. <laughs> so I like I'm with the community. I don't get this, but at the same time, I don't really view it as a big deal because this card was kind of unplayable anyway, right? So uh, yell at me in the comments, Yondu fans. Uh, I, I, I'm ready. I can take it. I'm, I'm strong. Finally, let's cover some of the general updates that were made in this patch that were not changes to cards. First, they added a graveyard. You can see what cards were destroyed or discarded. One note, however, Wolverine, Sabretooth, Deadpool, X-23, those will not show up. In addition, they are adding an undo end turn function. So as long as your opponent has not ended their turn, you can go back to the staging step. That's when you are playing your cards. So the next time you notice you've made a horrific misplay, you can mash that undo end turn button and hope that your opponent has not locked the turn in. This should discourage the, you know, rope until end of turn, figure out how it happened and then snap kind of stuff. Hopefully it'll go a long way towards discouraging what I think everyone would consider the most annoying style of play in the entire game. They've also added custom borders, so now I don't have to go super far out of my way in order to make all my cards purple border anymore, but I do think this is an effect that most people were expecting maybe more from. Me personally, I mean, my cards are all purple border anyway. That could be. It, it is what it is, basically. And finally, they have added a gold pass similar to Genshin and Honkai. You are now going to be able to purchase a gold pass and then get rewarded each time you log in for the day. It seems like it's a good deal, generally speaking, as long as they give us something to buy with that gold. Now, I'm sure you're wondering at this point why I have this graphic on the screen this whole time while I'm talking about all this other stuff. And don't worry, there is a good reason for that. They are changing these locations, or I should say making them more rare. The locations include Camp Lehigh, Collapsed Mine, Great Portal, Hotel Inferno, Shuri's Lab, Lamentus One, Nor Dimension, Rickety Bridge, Superflow, The Abbey, and Valley of the Hand. Their stated motivations for making these changes are twofold. First, they want to reduce how often locations add extra cards into the game. Kind of a stealth nerf to Loki. And they also want to balance locations that boost specific archetypes like Destroy. So they're definitely keeping an eye out for locations that are imbalanced based on the deck matchups. I think a lot of these are definitely those type of locations. However, I would like to point out that I do think one thing that I'm extremely happy about, Lamentous One finally getting made even rarer. They said they're making all these locations an additional amount rarer. Lamentous one is already rare. I think this means it's moving into ego tier. Thank God. They also got rid of that weird ordering thing that happens with on turn four and after turn four and all that kind of crap. So they standardized how the after turn X locations work. And I believe what that means is they now all sort of work like Starlight Citadel does. So it should be if you have two after turns, what'll happen is they'll they'll go in reveal order, but they will happen before like, you know, Sunspot goes, right? So this is now a standard thing. That timing is now standardized across all these locations, Los Diablo space, Asgard, things of that nature. It is a notable nerf to like kind of specifically Sunspot. Like anytime you're counting on a unit to do something at the end of turn, to like get a location before something changes. That's kind of the nerf that it would be too, but the only real example of that I can think of is you have a sunspot, you really want to win Asgard. Outside of that situation, I kind of can't think of anything. <laughs> I'd be interested to see if anyone else can come up with a situation where this legitimately impacts them. Please let me know in the comments. All right, y'all, well, that's gonna be it for me. For a little bit of a summary, I'm very glad they nerfed the Time Stone. I'm very excited and kind of scared to see what they did to Meek. I think Elsa Bloodstone is a bit of a lateral move. I'm glad they're addressing how unfun Leech is, and I'm very glad they're taking a look at the role of locations in game balance. I'm also excited to see Lamentus 1 getting nuked into the Ego tier of locations. Very happy for that. What are the things that you feel the most emotions about in this patch? This could be good or bad. Let me know in the comments below. I still read all of them, and I will read yours. Thank you so much. As always, I've been KM Best. You just got the KM Boost. I'm bringing it back. We're going to see how it does. 
Thank you so much for watching. See you in the next one.